Hello everyone, um, I'm Sarah Turner, I'm the director of the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art and it's a great pleasure to welcome so many of you here this evening in the room and to welcome our guests online um, and a very warm welcome back to the centre to Iris Moon um, to give tonight's research seminar entitled A Body for Stubbs and this is based on new material um, from the book Melancholy Wedge would, um, and which was published very, very recently, hot off the press. Um, and this will be exploring the relationship between the painter George Stubbs and the potter and entrepreneur Josiah Wedgwood in relation to the work Reapers of 1795, which many of you will know, a large um, oval ceramic tablet now in the collection of uh, the Yale Centre for British Art um, the, and, and bought by Paul Mellon for um, that collection in New Haven um, at Yale University. And I think there is a really, I was thinking about this, Iris, the, the relationship between the Mellons through Paul Mellon um, to purchasing that work and his interest in stubs, largely through horses and um, his, his interest in sporting art, but also at the Paul Mellon Centre, um, our relationship with Judy Edgerton and um, Edgerton's archive being in this collection as well. So those kind of, um, the historiography of Stubbs as well is something that um, I'm interested in and I think is of interest in quite a, for, for a number of people um, in this room as well. So we're really ex interested in exploring as well these kind of cross-material relationships that I know that you're going to um, get into um, more. And I know many of you know Iris's work. As I said, we were, we've had the pleasure of um, hearing from you um, at the centre on a couple of occasions last summer when you were speaking about the work you're doing on chinoiserie. And um, I know that's being developed for an exhibition project. Um, and um, many of you will know Iris's work as associate curator um, in the European Sculpture and Decorative Arts Department at the Met Museum um, of Art in New York, where she's responsible for European ceramics and glass and participated in that absolutely amazing reinstallation of the British galleries. And I still, it's one of those galleries that when I walk into, I always get a thrill. Um, and again, if, if those of you who've been in there, you'll know what I mean from the kind of, um, there's something about the ways in which it makes us look again at some very familiar objects, but also introduces us to new ones. And I think, again, that work that can happen when you're physically encountering objects in gallery spaces is, I know, something you're really interested in and how historic material speaks in the contemporary moment. Um, so we're really excited to have you back in London um, to hear about um, this, this recently published work um, and also hear about um, future projects and your ideas. So I know everyone will join with me in giving Iris a very warm welcome to the Paul Mellon Centre. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was such a wonderful introduction, and it's, it's truly a delight to be back here. Um, you know, those of you who know me know that I do love a bad pun, and I should have called this melancholy Wedgwood, but <laughs> might have been a little too on the nose. Um, but I, I did want to say before I start um, a huge, huge thank you to the Paul Mellon Center for the generous publication grant um, that made this book possible and to my really wonderful editor, Tom Weaver, um, who believed in the project from the beginning, even though it turns out that he hates Wedgwood, um, <laughs> which I found out later on, but so I'm especially grateful that he was still willing to, to take it on. So. Um, so for this evening, I'm gonna share some material from chapter two of the book, which focuses on Wedgwood's clay tablets for George Stubbs. Uh, I was told by a friend that it happens that this is the only section on Google Books that's not online, so you're in for a treat, I hope. <laughs> um, so, and I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Sheila and I meet on a gray afternoon at the Yale Center for British Art in New Haven, where George Stubbs' paintings of labor, labor are on view. The collection of Paul Mellon, philanthropist and lover of horses and British paintings, is housed in an austere travertine building by Louis Kahn, fitted out in a mid-century modern aesthetic of gray carpet, concrete, and wood. Sheila lives, by near, lives nearby in Branford, but doesn't visit the museum often. 
It appeals to a selective crowd whose preferred artworks are of horses, dogs, and British people. <laughs> Stubbs painted in all three of those categories, sometimes in the same canvas. He despised being called a horse painter, preferring the more noble sounding animalier. Exiting the elevator doors on the fourth floor, Stubbs' reapers immediately catches our attention. An oval slice of the English countryside set into a thick gold frame, the painting is bigger than a serving platter. It depicts a scene of harvesting in the shallow foreground of a field. The four figures to the left collect wheat as a man in a brown coat on a chestnut ho horse watches from the right of the composition. Visible in the distance is a church steeple with the label suggesting that the painting is an allegory of work. To work is to pray. The two men in the center stoop and swoop with sickles, reaping their way across the dense field of gold wheat. No sweat beads their brows and their white linen shirts and off-white breeches stay pristine. To their left, a dog sitting next to a barrel and a jug has just raised its head to look at the man on the horse, while a woman and a man bundle the crops. They pause for a moment to look up at the horse rider who wears a plain coat with shiny leather boots to match and an easy smile. The horse's slightly speckled rump glistens in the sun. The rider has just said something to them. They haven't yet answered. Haste is not a part of this picture thick with timelessness, meant to recall a much older constellation of images of harvesting and bounty, from books of hours showing the medieval laborers in the fields to Peter Bruegel the Elder's scenes of peasants at work and rest. In the Flemish master's version, a great sweep of land is shown with a path that loops through the composition, connecting the far hill replete with wheat to the partially culled field, with the workers taking a rest by a large tree. The painting famously pushed the reminders of religion far to the back of the composition, focusing instead on the secular vision of work, rest, and sustenance. In the foreground, the peasants guzzle, slurp, and chomp their victuals, with one man slicing a large wheel of cheese. Another wearing a hat stares off into space, rapturous at his filled belly, while yet another slumbers, limbs akimbo. The landscape is expansive and loopy, a peasant geometry that fills up the whole canvas, so that distance is measured in terms of hunger, work, and rest, not piety. If you rolled the wheel of cheese down the path, it would probably take a month to reach the bottom of the hill. In contrast with the great swoosh of land in Bruegel, Stubbs compresses his harvest into an intimate composition. He forecloses the middle ground into a narrow strip of wheat, whereas the Flemish painter's landscape leaves it wide open. Known for making freeze-like compositions, Stubbs pushes his figures far into the foreground, cutting off our view of what lies between the field and the church in the back of the painting. It's a pressure cooker of space, compounded by the oval format. Behind the rider's hat, the sun pierces the dark cluster of trees on a late summer's day, when the air crackles with heat and is speckled with tiny bits of pollen and insects. There is some tension across the arrangement of figures. Am I just imagining it, or is the woman bonding a sheaf of wheat, clenching her hands so tightly that her knuckles are white? Come close, and there are cracks. I see one in the clouds. It runs from the top left of the oval to the bottom right quadrant. Sheila beckons me closer and says, look, across the man's back. There's another one and it run runs all the way across. It slices in a T across his brown coat and down to the right, sectioning the horse's rump and the neat bundle of hay that terminates the right arc of the painting's edge. This is where Wedgwood materializes. You don't see him at first, but he's there in the cracks that appear across Stubbs's broken landscape of labor on the body as the ceramic grounds for his paintings. Now you know this is a picture of a fiction, an image of what never was. Um, so this is, the, this is the crack that I'm referring to right here. Stubbs painted Reapers in 1795 using the last of the clay tablets that had been produced for him at Etruria in the year that its founder, Wedgwood, died. Building upon his obsession with painting enamel on copper, Stubbs sought out larger and larger surfaces on which to apply the experimental pigments that he produced, quote, at great expense and endless labor, end quote. He had already approached Eleanor Code, 
the famous entrepreneur of the artificial sculpting and architectural material known as Codestone, but to no avail. Mrs. Code had coolly informed him that her stoneware was not fit for painting. Stubbs then turned to Thomas Bentley. This, this is not her, obviously. This is Elizabeth made out of Codestone. <laughs> Sorry, she just, you'll all notice that there are no labels. Um, it's, it was intentional, <laughs> I know, being a bad art historian. Stubbs then turned to Thomas Bentley, who managed a ceramic showroom in London, who passed on his inquiry to Churia. Wedgwood initially expressed reservations to his partner. Quote, tea trays were very hazardous things to make, and I cannot promise this, their success, end quote. But from 1775 until the 1780s, at the same time as he was experimenting with Jasper Ware, Wedgwood would work to develop for Stubbs a large, thin, and even surface that would take enamel paint without warping or buckling. Whereas the fickle and unwieldy Jasper Ware presented problems for Wedgwood in terms of its inconsistency and impermanence, his experiments on behalf of Stubbs posed the problem of firing at monumental scales that defied the typical norms of ceramic objects. Only a few of these large tablets were made, and the enigmatic painter would use some of them to return to the subject of fieldwork he had earlier explored in oil painting. For the artistic gatekeepers of the Royal Society, these were monstrous freaks because they pushed the boundaries of enamel painting, reserved at that point for dainty formats to gargantuan proportions. No matter how picturesque the depictions of labor offered by Stubbs' enamel paintings, they were seen by some as dinner plates put on the walls of a space reserved for high art. The first painting by Stubbs that struck Wedgwood's fancy was Laborers, displayed at the Royal Academy in 1779 and originally painted on behalf of Lord Torrington as an image of the men who worked for him. I tell Sheila that this was the other painting on ceramic that I wanted to see in New Haven, but knew it would be off limits to the public. From what I recalled, Laborers was darker than Reapers and more cloaked in shadows. The last time I'd seen the painting was in 2020, when I'd been given a private viewing of the New Haven conference room where Mellon's fancy for Wedgwood ceramics is quietly kept out of sight of the public. I remembered how surprising it was to find laborers displayed next to cases of Wedgwood Jasperware plaques and porcelain figures of Dr. Syntax. When Mellon donated his collection to Yale University and founded the Center for British Art, it was expressly stipulated that it should not collect decorative arts, which confers a hint to the forbidden on any soupçon of the decorative arts in Kahn's concrete building, Wedgwood included. The plaque featuring the laborers dwarfs in scale the ceramics in the display cases. Gone is a summer day in the rustle of wheat, replaced instead with four men in rumpled clothes who look like characters in a Beckett play. Crap, 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 and crap, let's say. In contrast to the syncopated rhythms of the wheat harvest out in the main galleries, here the men have paused to squabble around a cart being pulled by a workhorse with a large hound lying nearby the master rider on horseback is nowhere to be found. Far from the dark and dense trees of the foreground is a house with pleasant proportions, but a somewhat toothy dental cornice, surrounded by a neat white fence. This is probably the men's ultimate destination, given the bricks they load into the back of the cart. Work has stopped, for there's no bricks in the carts, only the pieces lying in shambles nearby. Here, too, is Wedgwood as a patron. The rustic version painted on canvas stopped him in his tracks when he saw it at the Royal Academy in 1779, so much so that he wrote to Bentley that he would have Stubbs do his family portrait instead of asking his friend, Joseph Wright of Darby. Stubbs, in fact, made several versions of this image, the original one painted for Lauren Torrington in 1767, the canvas exhibited in 1779, the enamel from 1781 that Wedgwood purchased, and the prints that disseminated the images to a wide audience beyond that of the Royal Academy. The narrative of Stubbs and Wedgwood's experiments have been naturalized as a facet of the Midlands Enlightenment, the artist's exploitation of the, quote, emerging technology of the Industrial Revolution, end quote, to achieve immortality for his work was a gold shared and understood by the equally ambitious entrepreneur. In this respect, the pairing of the preeminent horse painter to the aristocracy with a great purveyor of luxuries to the wealthy should not appear surprising. 
In an age of connectivity and networks, of gentlemen's clubs and the Lunar Society, the historical narratives of the period make it seem as if the meaning of these, meeting of these great minds was inevitable. Oops, sorry. In fact, at a certain point, Stubbs' self-portrait on a horse, painted on a Wedgwood plaque, was mistaken for Wedgwood himself. So closely aligned were their images that they became one and the same. And no other pair of producers during this period slipped so easily into the category of English heritage today, with Stubbs in particular signifying the desire of, quote, being English, not British, or wanting to be English, or wanting a prestige chunk of Englishness on your wall. And if none of that applies, it is still the case that, for lots of people, Stubbs represents an English national heritage of supreme tastefulness and appeal as the designers of chocolate boxes, biscuit tins, and other consumer comestibles have recognized. I found this on Etsy. I think you can actually still buy this, so. <laughs> it's pretty affordable. <laughs> if Stubbs is recognized mostly for painting horses, those lissom symbols of landed wealth, gambling, and leisure, his repeated reworking of laborers should tell us something about a self-taught artist whose visual memory decentered the human body in order to taste, trace horses, animals amassing powerful muscles and sinewy limbs, but also vulnerable prey. Hollyhock, snap, luster, whistle jacket, scrub, pumpkin, gimcrack, turf, and eclipse. Against the tide of horses racing to make money for their investors, Stubbs kept coming back in the compositions of his own making to pictures of labor and work, at times hard and slow, meditative and quiet, sometimes quizzical. The charge has been made that the leisurely depiction of work was never enough in the eyes of leftist art historians to clear Stubbs' name from the charge of supporting an aristocratic agenda. Listen to John Berger, for instance, who complained of his animal canvases. Quote, paintings of animals, not animals in their natural condition, but livestock whose pedigree is emphasized as a proof of their value and whose pedigree emphasizes the social status of their owners. Animals painted like pieces of furniture with four legs, end quote. I don't entirely disagree with Burgess' assessment, but Stubbs' painting on Wedgwood is weird, and their visions are not always aligned on the same goal. When I first thought about writing on Stubbs, I thought this was going to be about juxtaposing his images of horses and fields with what was described once as the, quote, ideology of landscape, end quote, where paintings of rustic pastures help to naturalize the process of enclosing common land and taking it into private ownership, and how this process took place in lockstep with the entrepreneurial extraction of the common resources of the Midlands, starting with the construction of the Trenton Mercy Canal, the first long distance canal in England, and one of the quote, great agents of modernity built to unleash all the dynamism of the industrial revolution, end quote, as one historian put it. And of course, you know, uh, Wedgwood had a hand in the Trenton Mercy Canal so that it would specifically cut right through Etruria. So that's something to keep in mind. Wedgwood himself had lobbied for and supported this engineered waterway, which connected the port of Liverpool with its access to global markets to the landlocked pottery towns of Burslem, Tunstall, and Stoke. But when I encountered reapers again in New Haven, this is not what came to me at all. I didn't think about landed gentry, the enclosure of the commons, or canals slicing through the Midlands. Instead, I kept seeing the tight and almost suffocating compression of the foreground, a bubble of airless space that brought the reapers close to me, and the weird tension of picturing labor as cooked space on a platter. For that's what this is. Stubbs' paintings on Wedgwood are examples of what have been described as art made in the age of combustibles when fire and chemistry were the determinants in making of British aesthetics. The art historical focus has for the most part been on Joshua Reynolds, the academician par excellence, whose canvases of eminent and illustrious faces quickly became ravaged by his experiments with caustic media, defined by their impermanence and alterability. Stubbs, horse painter, barely registers, even though he was the one who sought to make paintings permanent, almost in direct opposition to Reynolds, by serving them on a platter cooked in Josiah's kilns. But more than this competitive world of science, I wanted to know what Stubbs saw in Wedgwood's bodies and why he wanted to paint this picture on a ceramic plate 
and what he saw there that was so different from copper, panel, paper, or canvas. He'd used these other surfaces to considerable acclaim, but ceramics? No way. Judy Edgerton believes that clay cost Stubbs his accreditation with the Royal Academy. It was a danger to his reputation and his skills. It lacked pedigree, it lacked polish, partly because it was already a body that lived in the world of commerce, not high art. It belonged on the table, not the wall. The Royal Academy, striving so hard to establish painting as a liberal art, developed a strong distaste for Stubbs' ceramic ovals. The other thing I thought about when staring at Stubbs' oval paintings was birth. What does it feel like? It's the passage of a meteorite crashing through the eye of a needle. When you're the body bearing the room, intellection gives way to ferocious animal feeling and the force of bearing down and out of what's inside you. There is no head, there's only body. What nobody tells you about is the selective hearing and how the hollow of space nearest to your ear is open and listening. So if anyone's gonna direct you with the next steps, they will have to enter this airless bubble of space until the baby comes crashing out of you. My metaphors are failing here. Instead, what wells up are the pictures of Stubbs' as horses. Being attacked by lions again and again in different postures and scenarios but the same feeling of total surrender and vulnerability on the one hand, and in the same picture plane, oops, unbridled ferocity. Art historians love to use the word birth to describe the beginning of something, of genius, of the modern, of the new, of modernity, of freedom. But I wonder, do they really know what birth feels like? It fucking hurts. Babies, not horses, were among the first subjects of experimentation for self-taught stubs and around which the ovals appeared so that we have an uncanny convergence, a pun in the oven, of an artist in gestation happening through in utero. We don't know much about Stubbs's life. Reticent, intense, and heavy set, he left very little in the way of archival evidence or personal records. For the most part, what we know about him comes from the conversations he had with fellow artist Ozias Humphrey. He was born in Liverpool like Wedgwood's partner Bentley, the son of a courier, a tradesman who dressed tanned hides, preparing them for the fashioning trades that would turn them into usable leather goods such as reins, saddles, and belts. Using urine as part of the process, the work of the courier stinks. Stubbs would have encountered the ships entering the great city port, the mouth of the motherland feeding on the colonial expanses of the empire, connecting them to the metropole. He worked for his father until he was about 14, by which time he had already developed a keen interest in drawing and anatomy. The young Stubbs tried and failed to apprentice to local portrait painters such as Hamlet Wynne Stanley. Copying the works of other painters was the standard way of learning, but Stubbs did not do copies. Humphrey relates that even at an early age, the painter resolved to study directly from nature, which brings us to Stubbs and the York County Hospital, where he encountered John Burton, the Jacobite doctor, who would be eternally lampooned in Tristram Shandy as Dr. Slop, papist and man midwife. At the York Hospital, Stubbs made his babies. Seeking to study anatomy, he took up residence at the hospital founded by Burton in 1740, to treat poor patients and to function as a medical school. Far from providing palliative care, the institution only admitted patients seeking surgery. So what Stubbs would have encountered there was mostly, quote, cutting for the stone, setting of broken bones, and where necessary, amputation, end quote. A quick learner, Stubbs became a teacher of anatomy, taking on students of his own. Cadavers were procured for the young artist, curious to study the sinews, muscles, and limbs of the body at an intimate distance. It's said that his first dissection was of a hanged criminal. It was the only way to study them, with the stench of death hanging over the body. The engraving Stubbs undertook to illustrate Burton's medical treatise, an essay towards a complete new system of midwifery, are one of the few records we have of the painter's time here. Published in 1751, the treatise promoted Burton's newly developed forceps as a method for delivery, offering, quote, several new improvements whereby women may be delivered in the most dangerous cases with more ease, safety, and expedition than by any other method heretofore practiced, end quote. And to pique the reader's interest, Stubbs' illustrations, unsigned, were dangled on the frontispiece, 
quote, all drawn up and illustrated with several curious observations and 18 copper plates, unquote. Stubbs recounted to his biographer the intense pressure he was under to provide the plates, primarily because Burton was trying to steal a march on his rival, William Smelly, whose own much more influential treatise on the theory and practice of midwifery, illustrated by Jan van Remstedt, would be published one year later. Both men sought to publicize their respective developments on obstetric forceps, instruments used to help in the delivery of complex and dangerous births, such as breech babies, which up until then had often led to the death of mother and child. Sure, Doc, happy to make plates of dissected newborns. Humphrey, uncomfortable, described these as, quote, fetuses, wombs, infant children, etc., etc., etc. No problem. Did I mention that I don't know how to engrave? Oops, sorry. Stubbs did not want to engrave the plates, having no experience in printmaking, and perhaps not a little daunted by the prospect of depicting such complex dissections at the age of 21. He later recalled that Burton, quote, wouldn't listen to excuses, pressed upon him the undertaking, insisting upon it, end quote. This is why he refused to sign the plates, feeling that his first early undertakings in engraving, in which he would become quite accomplished, had taken place under duress and were very imperfect. Nonetheless, he soldiered on using some of Burton's private patients for the plates. For the other illustrations, he relied upon the corpse of a woman who had died in childbirth, which had been secretly smuggled by his anatomy students into York Hospital, quote, where it was concealed in a garret and all the necessary dissections made, end quote. It was from such instances, according to Edgerton, that Stubbs gained his early vile renown, tainted by his clandestine anatomy studies. Published a little over two decades before William Hunter's epic large format anatomical atlas of the uterus, Burton's treatise is very much a working man's text, portable and meant to be carried in a pocket or leather bag strapped to a horse. Though writing from a position of medical experience, Burton was clearly indebted to, but always correcting, the received wisdom of practicing women midwives. At the same time, he bristled against the satires and rumors that were already circulating around him when the book appeared. He dedicates the work to the members of the Royal Society in London and the Medical Society in Edinburgh. Though he confesses that he had not met most of these illustrious men in person, he publishes the book in their name, sharing the like-minded aim of propagating, quote, all beneficial knowledge to the world in general, but more particularly that branch of it, whereby the lives and healths of mankind are, be, are to be preserved, end quote. The book is, let's see, sorry. Um, the book is divided into four principal parts. Burton begins with an anatomical and physical description of, sorry, and this is not Burton, this is the um, Hunter book. Burton begins with an anatomical and physical description of, quote, bones of the pelvis and their structure, the true fabric and situation of the womb, quote, end quote, based on, quote, a person that was opened after dying undelivered at her full reckoning, end quote. The next part focuses on the disorders of pregnancy and methods for treatment, while the third section looks at methods of assisting women in, quote, preternatural labors with or without instruments, end quote. The final section looks at abortions. Burton emphasizes the importance of firsthand experience in delivering his theory of midwifery, which he explains as, quote, no more than practice reduced to the rules, end quote. Each description is paired with Burton's direct observations of his deliveries of women from all classes and situations in the vicinity of York County Hospital, some successful, others less so. But since the reader cannot witness the births he has attended, he signals the usefulness of the copper plates, noting, quote, judicious persons must be sensible that in describing objects not to be seen, the reader will have a better idea of them from a true representation upon a plate than only from a bare description, as is evident in all branches of philosophy. Malthus's book on population is still some 50 years away, but already you can picture the explosion of midwife treatises in the mid-18th century as feeding into a larger network of capitalist anxieties on population, reproduction, and resources. The womb was of interest not only to medical professionals, 
but through the economists who are calculating the nation's wealth based on life expectancies and the amount of potential labor to be exploited in its name. In fact, one could say that, quote, the birth of this timeline of capitalism depended upon the disciplining of the female body in making the site of reproduction available to science and midwifery. The lives and healths of mankind are, pe are to be preserved, as Burton puts it. The clock is ticking and labor, while momentarily arrested here in the interests of picturing enlightenment knowledge, is already being harnessed to production and national wealth. The intervention of male midwives in the womb could also be read as an expression of a budding masculine anxiety about origins and the desire to lay claim to the site of generation. Anne McClintock asserts that, quote, the fact of being deprived of a womb is the most intolerable deprivation of man since his contribution to gestation, his function with regard to the origin of reproduction is hence asserted as less than evident, as open to doubt, end quote. Something of the old way of picturing the world of the womb as a mysterious space of female fluidity lingers on in Burton's texts and is channeled in Stubbs's plates. It's helpful to compare Burton's modest text with Hunter's much more ambitious volume to understand how they conceived of the woman's body. Oh, sorry, I went ahead. Hunter, physician extraordinary to Queen Charlotte, whom Stubbs would later encounter in his work on zoological anatomies, dedicated his monumental atlas, Anatomy of the Human Gravid Uterus, to George III, publishing the text in Latin and English, and using highly detailed illustrations to represent, quote, only what was actually seen, end quote. The objective, of course, was to familiarize medical students and practitioners of the uh, obstetrics with the architecture of the womb. Hunter's clinical language paired with incredibly visceral images of women's bodies rendered into pieces of flesh. The secrecy of birth mapped, medicalized, graphically exposed, and rendered traversable. Why else the phrase, an anatomical atlas? In contrast, Burton's country doctor prose is practiced on the move, with the plates intended to show exceptional births that prove difficult or even monstrous. One of the most melancholy cases, he writes, is that of a child which is positioned correctly, but, quote, cannot be brought forth either on account of the extraordinary size of its head or of any other parts being too large in proportion. Among the most disturbing images is Table 17, which shows what Burton calls a monster, Hunter would have preferred a medicalized term. Figure one represents a monster born without a head of which I delivered a woman in the city, York, in January 1749 in a view where part of the back and right side are shown with one hand and foot exactly drawn from nature. The image shows a body in parts along with multiple instruments meant to help facilitate its passage from the inside of the body to outside. There's a flustered quality to the mark making of the plates cross-hatching gone willy-nilly, sometimes shaped to contour and define, other times going off piece to become a piece of downy hair. It's as if in being forced to illustrate parts of nature that he himself quite, cannot quite process or understand, Stubbs is trying to figure out not only the medium of engraving, but how to depict these three-dimensional alien forms, half-formed beings that he's never seen alive on the surface of the flat page. So far, no preparatory drawings have been found. The depiction of the womb and cross-section is, of course, like all architectural renderings, a fantasy, an impossible viewpoint from which we have to insert ourselves into a curved, watery space that would never admit another. Close examination of the engravings reveals uneven cross-hatching and a confused understanding of baby limbs floating in amniotic fluid. In Table 10, the composition of two wombs stacked on top of each other makes them resemble mirror images rather than two separate examples of birth positions. The awkward eruption of the hand, Burton's, at the bottom invades both the plate and the womb, serving as a forceful reminder of what these representations entail. The composition is not just a composition, but presents a physical problem. How will the baby contained in the misshapen oval get out? Table 16 shows a variety of tools intended to help deliver the baby safely, but their shapes and oversized scale in relation to the womb make them appear more like weapons. Who will pull the footling breech out despite his impossible position? Who will unravel the umbilical cord safely? It's very intense. Who will put the baby in the right position? Who will pull the baby out? How will they get out? I have to pause from looking at Burton's book 
It's an intense experience, unfolding the pages to reveal the plates inserted at strategic moments of the text with instructions provided to the bookbinder. For the observations on successful births are outweighed by the complications that cannot be resolved, by women traumatized and babies lost. Reading in the archive is supposed to be a contemplative activity, for it's quiet like a church, but I can feel my blood pressure rising and my heart pounding, and it gets harder and harder to turn the pages. I can't read anymore. These are images of births gone wrong, pictures of errors of body parts in the not right places and positions, which Stubbs is being asked to memorialize over and over in the space of the printed page, with tools he's using for the first time. Specialists in the works of Stubbs, the painter of prestige chunks of England, like to ignore or forget these early plates. They have been described as grungy, ugly, and grubby little prints, expressions unveiling more than a hint of chauvinistic disgust at the picturing of the secret space of a woman's inside, an architecture of interiority, inaccessible no matter how much the doctors of the 18th century sought to force the hand of their engravers to open up the wound to the panoptic medical gaze, Burton and his more successful rival, Smelly included. Try as you might, you'll never know what it feels like to go back to the womb. But Stubbs has carved out an indelible space on the page for the womb so that once seen, they cannot be forgotten. For our own purposes, these illustrations point to the site of the oval as a primal scene for Stubbs, a cooked space born from pressure to which the painter returned again and again in a sort of repetition compulsion in his compositions made on Wedgwood tablets. This prehistory provides an alternative context for reading his paintings on ceramic and the psychical investments they contained. Stubbs did not often return to the subject of babies after this early experience on the Burton text. In the midst of pictures of sublime terror, of horse against lion, of Phaeton driving his father's chariot to disastrous consequences, of muscles and men and adrenaline, the mature Stubbs made a momentary return to depict a mother and child in a circular format of copper on enamel where it's unclear whether the child is alive or dead. Not much has been written on the strange painting from 1774. Edgerton hesitates on the iconography for this enamel, as well as another entitled Hope Nursing Love, dismissing the possibility that these images represented his partner, Mary Spencer, with their son, George Townley Stubbs, since the latter was already in his 20s at this time. Nonetheless, the impulse to find a place for these babies within an autobiographical context demonstrates just how much of a painterly aberration they were in the arc of the Animalier's career. Thank you. I, I, I knew I shouldn't have worn mascara. questions uh, online as well. My colleague Rebecca is going to look out uh, for those for us. But thank you so much, Iris, because I, I think you probably took us all to unexpected places. And that was really, actually, I was just sort of, you know, watching and listening. And that journey through time and space um, was, was quite unexpected, I think, for, for me anyway. And just made me think about stubs in ways that I just, I haven't done before so thank you uh, for that because it just felt it felt raw and I, I you know we obviously could see that for you as well and reminds us that you know our writing our careers our reflections are not divorced from our own circumstances and acts of genesis of books and Babies and families and life, all of these are entangled for, for many people. So anyway, thank, I just wanted to say thank you for that because I, I, you know, it, was, it's a, it was very um, yeah, moving and um, just yeah, fantastic to feel that process um, of writing and, and reflecting with you. And it did make me think in um, 
different ways about stubs and space because it's actually a, a, a work that you showed, which again I know because it's in the Yale Centre for British Art collection. Um, I think it's called is it the Rubbing Down House at, Mar at Newmarket, um, where you know you've got these. The, the, the structure of that building and then so much space so much sky um, and I've always thought that to be these compositions are always uh, the, the strangeness the weirdness of of the relationship between um, yeah, either you know yeah exactly um, and obviously in whistle jacket there's a lot of thinking there about the relationship between body and space <laughs> But I think it was a phrase you used about the pressure cooker of the space in the Reapers. So sometimes this incredible containment and then the contrast of vastness. So there's this kind of, I don't know, this, this play that Stubbs is, 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 is kind of working on through composition. And in these, it just really made me think about these different formats and what's happening there. But there, there was something about the Stubbs and space, which then seeing it through this... Um, container of the womb space and midwifery I, you know just really got me thinking about that but can you tell us more about how you how you arrived at this chapter you know where that came from and just kind of set the scene for us um, a bit there sure is this on yeah oh okay um yes so I've never done a reading of this chapter in particular and it was like wow um really you know I think when you read it out loud you're sort of back into that space um, speaking of space and stubs, well, for me, um, I mean, the entire book is very much colored by a subjective take on everything, right? I mean, um, in the sort of promotional material, I call it an experimental biography, and it's like, well, what does that even mean? Um, but for me, I, I was interested in this idea of a biography is always about more than one person, Right? I mean, we tend to sort of assume that's about a sort of single timeline from birth to death, but that timeline of birth to death is so interwoven with so many different people. Um, and, you know, I wondered if it was possible to kind of change the composition a little bit so, you know, the book is equally about Wedgwood, but also inheritance, right? I mean, the second generation, but it's also about me in a way. I mean, not to foreground that, but just to say, you know, my version of Wedgwood cannot be the same as others. Um, and I really wanted to be honest about that from the beginning. Um, but with Stubbs, I think I've always really loved his paintings, but I never really knew what to do with them because they're like horse paintings. And I don't really know, like, that's a very alien subject to me, you know, I mean, well, first, like I'm a ceramics person, you know, I do stuff on plates and cups and saucers, and um, and you're right. There's there's a sense, there's a management of space in his horse paintings that's so much about a vastness, but also about a weird kind of sense that they're artificial, right? I mean, you would never go into a field and see this perfect portrait of a horse, right? Sort of Stun, yeah. standing there. Um, and so there are these incredible combinations of stillness, vastness, but also, right, I mean, horses are all about that kind of muscular agility and, and tension and, you know, that moment that they spring from the gate, you yeah. know? And so there's always that underlying sense of um, a kind of ferocity and, and but also the, a sort of vulnerability. And um, they are pure muscle, you know, it's like, and I, I don't know, like, I, I was just always sort of interested in trying to find a way to, to talk about Stubbs and because he's such a weird painter. And I mean, Wedgwood's also kind of weird, but weird in the sense that we tend to take for granted that we know everything about them. Mm, I like that weirdness in, like, not knowing what to do. Yes. Or where to, you know, that, exactly. again, that's sort of how to encounter these artists again. Yeah, and I was so surprised... When I went to the Morgan Library and I saw the Burton midwifery, and, and Judy, I'm so glad that you mentioned Judy Edgerton because that book is like mm. amazing. I mean, she's such a phenomenal Stubbs scholar and there's a great sensitivity to him as an artist that yeah. 
I mean, for a catalog resume, you're like, oh my God, this is like amazing. It's an amazing project. It's such yeah. an amazing mm. project. And it's so, and, and she talks about the midwifery treatise um, with a great deal of sensitivity, but also kind of like, I don't really know what to do with this because it's sort of the aberration, right? Mm. And I was interested in the, I mean, the whole book is about aberrations and things that don't fit in, right? And I was like, well, has anyone actually looked at this book and tried to figure out what to do with it? And so... I had seen it at the Morgan Library, and then I went to the um, Mellon Center in um, New Haven to look at the paintings again on the Wedgwood platters, and I was like, oh, is there some kind of connection here between... Because I think what's so great about Stubbs is that on the one hand, we think of him as this like kind of boring, traditional horse painter, right? Like heritage. But on the other hand, he was incredibly experimental I mean, the fact that he went to Wedgwood and was like, make me a giant platter that I can paint on, you know, very specifically. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's a kind of very interesting aspect to him that, that I, I, I was sort of, I wanted to mine a little bit. But, you know, I'm not a paintings person. I'm not a um, stub specialist by any means. Um, but I found him to be a very compelling character um, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think, yeah, fantastic. Oh, I can already see hands being raised. So, Malcolm, I saw yours first. Oh, thank so, you. Uh, that, that was wonderful and absolutely enthralling and, and powerful. Um, I, 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 I was very struck by, by how you, you, you um, spoke about the, that object uh, and made it so unsettling. Um, but there were, there were two, two aspects that I think one... If, if we think of ceramic objects or ceramic images, we think of them often having a border, and that sort of lacking. I'm not sure whether that, that the frame it's in is its original frame or, or, or I don't know. I, I think it might be. Might be, yeah. Um, so it does have a border in a sense, but not, not the border that you would mm -hmm. expect. I'm thinking of things like Limoges painted enamels, which have those are very elaborate boundaries, borders, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, the, 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 the second thing is, is the, the sort of wider issue about the relationship between the fine arts and the decorative arts. And, and if, even those of us who have been for years involved with the decorative arts as well as the, the, the fine arts still have a sort of <laughs> divide in, in our head. I, I've, I've experienced this with, 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 with Rubiliac, who, who um, very early on, um, there's a record that, that one of his um, monuments, uh, the relief, was going to be in Chelsea porcelain. And, and, and it wasn't. And I've always rather se separated out the attempts to attribute um, cer ceramics to, 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 to Rubiliac. And I, I, think, I think I'm probably wrong about that. And, and, and it's because... I've somehow sort of internalised this familiar divide. And what, what you've done is to really prompt us to think that afresh from a different point of view. So this is my two comments. You, no, I, I, I completely agree with you. And you know, thank you so much for, for that comment. And I think you're right. I think, and I also have that kind of internalised division, right, that the flat art is the fancier stuff and the <laughs> stuff that sits on the table is the less fancy, <laughs> the 3D stuff. Um, and, I, and I wonder, you, you know, I'm sure it's like a part of, right, the sort of historiography of art and history and, and whatnot, but you do wonder when that internalized division happened. And I do think maybe it was a part of that 18th century moment, right, when the academy was trying to assert itself yeah, yeah. as this authoritative body, and they could not, right, they could not accept someone who was trying to push this medium in a new direction and, and you know I think Stubbs never really I mean from what I understand he never really decided to go back to the academy after he had that horrible episode where he tried to hang his um, enamel paintings and you know they sort of they were like no this is we're not doing this um, but yeah the internalized division I think is a really interesting one and certainly something that I was trying to grapple with um, as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Iris. That, well, who knew? <laughs>
Um, you took us so wonderfully from the uh, oval form of the etched wombs to the oval form of the platter, suggesting that was a, a sort of primal moment, as it were, for, for Stubbs. And I wonder whether you found there was any discussion in the 18th century of a connection at the level of subject matter between what we now call the labor of the woman bringing a child into the world and the labor of the fields, the, the agrarian farm labor of the fields. Question one and question two is, I just wondered whether there were other artists besides Stubbs who painted on these large flat surfaces for Wedgwood or was this a unique production from the Wedgwood standpoint? Um, yeah, that's too, oh, Susan asked the best questions. Um, yeah, so I think, I think to the first, to the first question, I, I don't recall that being a part of the discourse per se. I wanna say it's more of a 19th century, yeah. if anything. Um, and, you, you know, I, I, but I don't think it really was a connection um, in any way. Although I would love to know if, you know, anyone has sort of a, a different take. Um, to the second question, when, when Stubbs approached Wedgwood, you know, he had dollar signs, well, pound signs in his eyes. Because <laughs> he was like, oh, this is my great moment. I'm gonna use this guy. First he's gonna do my family portrait, which he hated. He never liked the family portrait. It was just like a, he found it a disaster. Um, but he invites Stubbs over to stay in Etruria. Um, obviously to cut down on costs, he's like, let's share an office in the stables because we're doing renovation work, it'll be fine. <laughs> We can share it, you know, we won't have any issues. And then immediately puts him to work, right? He's like, well, have you thought about ever doing models for Blue Jasper? Um, would love it if you tried things out. And Stubbs is like, oh my God, like I did not realize what I was getting into. And so one of the plaques that I show, you know, this is one of the, let's see, where is it? You know, this is Wedgwood's attempt to get to put Stubbs to work, right, in, in creating one of these famous scenes and, and you know, he does the Phaeton and, um, and so on and so forth. But Wedgwood very early on recognizes he's like, these are terrible. I can't sell these, no one's gonna buy these, they're just commercial failures. And so there's an understanding that um, he can't really commercialize Stubbs in the same way that, for example, Flaxman is like such a great designer for Wedgwood objects, and mm. Stubbs just doesn't translate well yeah. in, into ceramics. Mm. Um, in terms of paintings, like Stubbs' paintings, I mean, they were not commissioned by Wedgwood, right? He was never really commissioned, well, with a caveat, he did do portraits of Wedgwood's father-in-law, um, his wife, and he did do those on, on um, ceramic plaques, so there was a little bit of an understanding that like, oh, this is an interesting new medium, I'd like to somehow exploit it in some way, but it was never going to be a commercial success. Um, and I think at some point, they realized this was a terrible idea to work together and you know, Stubbs sort of parts ways and, I mean, he does the family portrait and, and, um, <coughs> and I think actually Wedgwood owned, um, I think he owned the laborers at one point um, if I remember correctly. But yeah, it was just not a happy, happy marriage because I think Stubbs, for all the work he did as a commercial artist, right, painting horses and stuff, I really think he thought of himself as an artist, right? He <coughs> wanted to experiment. And, and the fact that he comes back to these platters at the very end of his life, I mean, he does laborers in 1795, I think, which is right when Wedgwood dies. And the fact that he's coming back to this theme that he had visited earlier on, um, it says something, I think, about he saw that as a work of art that he wanted to do on another medium. So I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. That's a question. Hey, Emma. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, thanks, Iris, very much. I wanted to ask about the question of axes, because you made this connection between the womb and the shape, the oval, but they are, of course, one is, the oval of the womb is that, you know, is vertical, and that's a horizontal 
oval. And then, of course, if it's a platter, it's horizontal in another way. But then if it's put up on the wall, it's, it's vertical that way around. And, and, of course, it's an oval on a wall. It's precisely not a window into the world. It's part of a decorative ensemble, usually, because it's a traditional shape, isn't it, for a decorative landscape sent into it. So that's like it's sort of flatness and resisting the idea that it's a representational view. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about this question of axes. And I also wanted to ask about the fact that it is a reproduction of an existing painting. It made me think, because when Greuze exhibits his painting of a, of a betrothal at the Salon of 1761, Diderot says this kind of painting that's kind of, I think, to do with the kind of hard edge clarity of it, so sort of similar in a way to Stubbs, it's particularly appropriate for reproduction and suggests it should be painted in enamels. Mm -hmm. So I think there's this whole question of reproducibility and enamels and getting back to this question of why ceramics, is it to do with reproducibility or durability? What exactly is he getting at, I, if that makes sense? Sure. Um, so the oval question, I mean, I think, I do think compositionally it does something to a picture, and I think mm, Stubbs totally. was cognizant of that because the, the earlier version of laborers, reapers, are on square formats, right? It's a typical canvas mm. where you have the whole thing. I mean, speaking of borders, right? It's the illusion that there is no border, right? It's a kind of endless sweep of landscape. And again, coming back to that Stubbs and space question, there's an immediate contraction and compression of space that happens when he translates that image onto an oval format. Totally. And I think, I mean, not to bring in a kind of modernist thing, but it's medium specific, right? And I just wanted to show, I didn't reproduce it on the, in my slides, but this is the back of the earliest experimental um, Stubbs painting that we know of. And it's actually the back x-ray of a Wedgwood platter um, that he used to paint on. And what's unusual about, this is at the YCBA as well, and on the, on the surface is a uh, sleeping cheetah. Leopard? Leopard, cheetah? yeah. Sleeping leopard. It, leopard sounds better than cheetah. Think, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyways. So it's, um, it's gorgeous. And, and it's such a wonderful mm. painting because mm. it's this curled up um, mm. spotted leopard sort of dead center mm. in, the, in the plate. But you don't know it's a plate unless you turn it around. And apparently they did x-rays of it and it even has the Wedgwood impressed mark which means that he was experimenting on a ready-made plate, testing out this oval composition to see what his painting would look like. And there's something, I mean, I'm probably projecting a little bit, but there is something about this curled up sleeping leopard that is evocative in some ways of the work he was doing for Burton and trying to figure out how to fit this figure onto an oval format. Um, I mean, you're right, like I think obviously it's not a literal, right? The ovals on Burton are more vertical and, um, but this un understanding that some kind of contraction of space is happening and a, and a compression, I think he was very much attuned to and kind of interested in, mm. um, yeah, in even a way. the process of firing. Yep. You know, and material shrinkage in the kiln. Uh, you know, just things like it just makes me really think about mm -hmm. again that what what's happening through that experiment with materiality and absolutely. Yeah. And I think he knew a little bit about that process of like painting then firing because he did the enamel mm. on copper, and so I'm, I assume that the process is somewhat similar, but it's also different because you know the the sort of rate at which the water is being removed from the colors and, and being fired. Um, and that whole process is so different when it's an expanded format, right? Mm. Like a huge plate. I mean, this, you know, this is, it's like a, it's a yeah. sizable it's big, yeah. platter. There was a question here and then there's a question in the front. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for your talks. Very moving, especially the bits around, um, you know, where you were moved and we were moved. Um, um, and um, noting that uh, Stubbs was, um, was around during the time of enslavement, and I know that he did, I think, horse and dog trim was done on a um, plantation, slave plantation, mm -hmm. 
in Jamaica. And um, I was just curious because as you were talking, I was remembering lessons that I'd learned from black history about the forceps, the tools for during pregnancy was developed from enslaved black women and experimentation and looking at some of your images and the cross sections. And I just wondered if, if, if in your research uh, you had come across anything that associated Stubbs with um, that period of enslavement and you know, the you know, suffering of women, particularly women of um, African heritage were enslaved uh, in your studies? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, I think, and you know, again, I'm not a specialist of Stubbs. This is sort of my first foray into his work. But from what I understand, where you see empire appear, right, is in the form of these kind of exotic animals, right, that are that are being sort of studied and and kind of um, categorized by him as as a as a type of painting, right, animal painting. Um, you know, he does he does a spotted leopard. There's the the zebra. Yes, the zebra. Um, so, but in terms of the medical connection. Um, I mean, absolutely, I think that would have been a part of the medical culture of the period, right? This idea that you could use um, knowledge developed in the colonial context and feed that into enlightenment concepts, right, of medicine as a sort of rational, reasoned um, form of knowledge. But I don't know specifically if there were doctors, I mean, I don't think Burton went to Jamaica specifically, but there's of course um oh my god what's his name uh in the late 17th century oh my god british museum sloan. yes yeah. sloan thank you i mean han sloan was a doctor right who goes to jamaica in the 1680s um and he is absolutely there on the ground right sort of witnessing um the sort of um exploitation, right, of these bodies. And I'm sure that had a role in the kind of medical knowledge that he claimed to develop after coming back from Jamaica and sort of rebranding himself, right, as this expert in, in medical knowledge. Um, but I, don't, I mean, I'll have to think more about the Stubbs and the Stubbs and midwifery connection. But I mean, for sure, you can trace Right, a connection to empire and, and colonization. I mean, that's, it's there um, already. So. There's a, oh, just, if you just wait for the microphone so people can hear you online. Thank you. <laughs> Do we know how many plaques were actually made and who paid for them? Did Stubbs pay for them or did Wedgwood, because they're experimental, give him to them? How was the financing of this? Like, that is such a great question, and I, you know, Robin Emerson is the great uh, discoverer of the uh, tea trays book and, and the sort of records that had, um, and, I, and I sort of reproduced the, so this was in Judy Edgerton, um, based on Robin Emerson's work, and I, I mean, as far as I understand, the trade-off was that Stubbs would paint portraits for Wedgwood in exchange for him making these platters. I mean, that was basically, he put him to work to pay off. I mean, it's like there is no wasting money for Wedgwood. Exactly. So the, the trade-off was, you'll do a portrait of my father-in-law, you'll do a portrait of my, my wife, of myself, of my children, right? And then you can eventually pay off your, you know, because Stubbs wasn't a very wealthy artist. Um, absolutely. Whether the buyers put in the price of the, of the plaque or not, but it was sort of a sort of given thing rather than a financial today. Right, and I don't think, I don't believe these were financially, I mean, sorry, commercially successful in any ways because they were so kind of niche. Um, but I do have, so um, from Emerson's records, 94 of these um, um, platters were put into the kiln and only 39 survived. Wow. So, you know, we're talking about almost half um, not making it. And, and it's, such a, it's such an amazing record because there are comments in the oven book where he's like, oh, two broken fire, one earlier, two broken fire, three, it says crassed but cracked basically, 
too broke. I mean, there's so many, one dunted, I assume that means dented. Um, so, you know, it was a terrible loss for Wedgwood in a lot of ways, which for him, because he's an entrepreneur and he's so good at making money, it was just like, oh. Um, but somehow they, you know, some of them managed to survive, so. Where did Melon get his from? Do you know where it came from, was it? That is a really great question. I mean, I don't think there was really a market for these specific, right? Yeah. So the Lady Lever Gallery has great examples. Um, they have a number. So Liverpool has really, you know, a couple mm. of really great ones. But yeah, I mean, Mellon has, th well, two, two of the sort of um, perfected ones and they have that great leopard yeah. plate. But Did I don't really know the provenance. The, the same dealer or, yeah. Yeah, Something it's definitely to possible. Be interesting to. Do you, yeah. art, market, art market. I know. So because and people had agents buying them from yes. dealers. So it's something. It's not. But it, sometimes there's a more specific trail, isn't there, Martin Postel? Do you want to? I think so. I mean, when, is it on? Sorry. Yeah. So when he was collecting, obviously in the sixties and seventies, I mean, he he was approaching a market that was under. English people, they weren't terribly interested in this. This was marginal stuff. This was the stuff on the market, especially works that were experimental and is it a work of art, is it a plate, is it a, what do you do, as you say, what do you do with it? Yeah. You know, obviously you don't need dinner off it, but the, and there is a tradition, as Malcolm was saying, of, of works on, you know, and, and enamels and, you know, whether it's Limoges or anything else. But I think, I think Paul Mellon was, was in, a, in a fortunate position in, in, in many ways because he had lots of money, but also... I'll be honest, in the art market in the 60s, there wasn't a lot of questions asked about where things were coming from. Mm -hmm. There was no such thing as spoliation. You didn't have to prove it, where it had been. You just picked it up. I guess the person we need is John Basket, mm. <laughs> who's still very much alive with us, who could uh, talk more about this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but anyway, I'd just like to add thank you so much. It's uh, fascinating. Um, because I, I do have a question, really, and it's, it's to do with... I, I haven't read your book yet, but you, is the title is Melancholy Wedgwood, and I just know a little... I don't know much about Wedgwood, and what I do know is in his relations with Joseph Wright rather than George Stubbs. As you say, he's, he's quite a character and drives a hard bargain, but the, even in the things he was involved with the Wright, there isn't a sort of melancholy aspect to those works. I mean, Wright himself is a melancholy character, as we know, I never think of Stubbs as that, but there's a great sense of morbid and mortality. Yes. Um, that's something we explored a few years ago in an exhibition that we had in Autobots, <laughs> where, where, where those two came very much to the fore, you know, the, the life, death, mortality. Uh, and if anyone was there, you might have a little evolution of whistle jacket, of course, with the skeleton of the clips in the same room. Mm. And it was very visceral, because mm -hmm. Stubbs's art is very visceral. And his animals are still very, very much real creatures, you know. And they're very. The fact that he was so sensitive to them and, uh, and, uh, when they were alive, and so sensitive to them when they were dead, yeah. uh, you know, it goes back to your points of those very moving videos, the disturbing pictures of, of the womb. There's a man who's been up to his problems in blood since he was a boy, yeah. and continued to be right the way through his life. And this is such a different world to, to most of his artistic peers. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, unfortunately, I, didn't, I wasn't able to see that show, but it sounded, I mean, the skeleton being incorporated is so fascinating. And, and I do wonder, I mean, not to read too much into his personal life, but I do wonder, you know, starting out at a young age, working in a courier's, right, workshop where you're dealing with, like, pieces of flesh, and having that tanned and, you, you know, taking those strips and turning them into these objects. I mean, it's such a different world compared to, um, I imagine, other artists. And, and I think you're right. I think maybe that lent him a, a sense of um, mortality and also just this idea of flesh being this, something to be studied and kind of dissected, but also um, intimately tied with death and... and um, yeah, there's, I don't know, there is something really morbid about his work in, in a really interesting way. And I mean, on the subject of Joseph Wright of Darby and, um, and Wedgwood, yeah, I mean, part of the sort of project was to say, right, progress, enlightenment, 
everything with an exclamation mark, right? I think maybe now is a time to kind of question that because there was always a side of capitalism and entrepreneurial, that spirit that was deeply melancholy. And you look at his experiment books and his letters to Bentley and he's just like constantly mourning the loss of all these ceramic bodies. I mean, no other, probably no other industry has more loss entailed than ceramics. Like you're only getting a couple of good pieces out of the kiln because it's such a volatile process. You never know what is actually gonna work and what's gonna survive. So the whole language of ceramics itself survivals, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, um, it's such a melancholy kind of thing. And, and, and I wanted that to be a part of the story of, of I mean, this version of Wedgwood um, in a way, so. But thank you for your questions, yeah. I've got another. Thank you, so that's not a question, just a, an addition, there's this great quote, and I don't even know when it was, but um, Wedgwood at some point, he does these fantastic trials and experiments, as he said, and he, um, he says something or along the lines, um, the, um, the, the dead have, no, the living have to pay for the dead, so mm. the ones that actually survive, they have to be sold at a price that actually make all these experiments worth it. <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and another thing on the, um, I'm, I'm not a stubs expert at all, um, but and I always think of Wedgwood hoping that, the, that he can actually make these ceramic canvases successfully so that he can not only support other artists, but also be the name of the back of these paintings, not only on the back of the plate. Um, so that maybe also chimes in with the melancholy, him hoping that he can make this work in large flat pieces, as many of you know, are really difficult to fire. And um, I think you, you read that in your book as well, that that's probably also one of the reasons why he chooses the oval format, because a square one would be even, even more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And, and interestingly, Dunted is an actual technical term. <laughs> oh, good to know. <laughs> so, because um, um, it's still being used in the 20th century, and it means something like when it's sort of, when you have a large surface and it sort of sacks. So it um, buckles a little. Yeah, it sort of sinks like a sinkhole almost. Yeah. <laughs> That's what dunting is, but if you mm. ever wanted to know. That's, <laughs> That's why I like I dented, love, I love but dunting, yeah. yeah. You can always rely on a, a PMC I, research seminar. I know, so. we need like we a, need. I feel like we need like a Stokey uh, dictionary, yeah. urban dictionary, that would be so great. Yeah. Oh my God, that, I think the PMC should sponsor that. Like a <laughs> Stokey dictionary, I love that. Yes, you can write it, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, that was really great. Yeah, thank, and there was uh, another question. I think um, we'll take this as our final question and then we can have more informal conversation um, oh, over you. drinks. So, um, I just had one very quick comment, actually, about the question about the relationship to enslave, enslavement. And I wondered if the sort of the idea of bloodlines and breeding in horses, I, I have a feeling that that's transferring over into some of the ways that, that people are talking about enslaved populations. And I wonder if there's a kind of connection there and the seeing of people as animals and as livestock that can be kind of bred to produce a certain sort of performance. Yeah. No, that's, that's um, a really, that's a really great connection. That, that feels very kind of um, vivid from in the connection as well between the, the womb um, engravings and the horse paintings. Yeah. No, that's um, a really great point. But I had a question about the, the sort of precision of the painting on the, on these ceramic surfaces. And do you feel like it's, um, there might have been any evidence of Stubbs interacting with the painters in Wedgwood's studios um, or getting any kind of information on how to paint on ceramic surfaces from artisans for whom that was their bread and butter? And I also wondered if um, that sort of the precision of the fracture, which in a way is perhaps in tension with the experimental nature of the whole undertaking, um, is part of the, the reason that it kind of seems decorative and sort of perhaps not as kind of exciting and new and doesn't take on this status of being able to raise up the, the ceramic bodies into the realm of kind of fine original art. Mm. Um, no, that's, that's a really great question. And um, I don't know, Rebecca, if you, you know better, but I, I mean, the thing with Wedgwood ceramics is that it wasn't decorated 
and painted them. And you know, there are early examples of transfer printed pieces where it is more representational, but the real aesthetic, right, of Wedgwood is that it wasn't painted because the body itself was stained and it was sculptural, right? So you had the sort of molded decoration. And I think that's why Wedgwood got him to try and try his hand at this sort of frieze-like um, decorations and a relief, relief uh, like decorations. But I mean, in terms of, I imagine if he was at Etruria, he would have had access, right, to some degree to to the workmen there. Um, but I would say though the decorate. I mean, there was another workshop in London exactly. where yeah, the decorators were. London, yeah, right. exactly. So, but what, what they, they painted mean, exactly? I mean, you know, uh, well, it's, it's older. I think, I think it's slightly earlier. Yeah, it's flowers. Um, yeah, Are you just um, just talking to the mic, just because for the online really audience. A, a very here. Thank you. general answer to this quite specific question. So yes, there was painters uh, in London in Little China Row, as he called it. Um, <laughs> so because the, acad the academies were here, the, this, the proper art schools were here, whereas yeah, you could learn great ceramics in Stoke, but paint painters were here. Um, so, but there will there will have been people at Etruria um, who were able to do that and. Um, Yes, Wedgwood's um, aesthetic, the blue and white, that is sort of his brand, that is what sets him apart, and that is, I presume, why he wanted Stubbs to do that, so that he could maybe collect yet another artist to do it in his style. Yeah. Um, that would be my my theory, but I, I'm not an expert on that. So yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think it quite worked out the way he wanted it <laughs> to be. But. <laughs> well, always the hallmark of an excellent research seminar as well, where it opens up more questions, um, and it feels like we're kind of setting off together on the next step of this journey. And I wanted to borrow Bridget's phrase of, of the vivid and vividness, because I feel like you brought Stubbs into this kind of a new vivid realm uh, for all of us. And again, just um, the kind of liveliness of our discussion and our questions. I hope, Iris, is you feel that of the interest that um, your work has inspired. Um, and I, just really new thinking on Stubbs as well. I feel that's really exciting. It feels like there's so much more work to do, to do on Stubbs and Wedgwood and, and, and beyond. So thank you so much for giving us you, um, an insight into your work. Thank you.